Okay, Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening. Uh, on behalf of Shivening Alumni Malaysia, I'd like to welcome all our panelists and viewers uh, to this virtual interface dialogue. It's our first event for the year. So I guess I should start by wishing everyone a happy uh, belated new year to all. Um, here's hoping that 2021 will be a less challenging year uh, than the last. Um, early signs um, don't look good, but you know, we can always hope for, for uh, brighter days ahead. My name is Akhil Yunus, and I am currently the Vice President of uh, CAM uh, for the 2020 uh, to 2022 term. I will just uh, go through very quickly, uh, introduce CAM, um, you know, our origin story, so to speak, and some of the activities that we've organized over the past uh, few years before handing over to our esteemed moderator to host the panel discussion. So if I can just quickly share my screen. Welcome to the Shivening Alumni Malaysia Interfaith Dialogue 2021. Um, so, CAM started, um, you know, is uh, basically an uh, official body of uh, Shivening scholars from the United Kingdom. And this scholarship essentially started in 1983 um, and actually began in Malaysia immediately the year after. Malaysia is the second largest recipient in Southeast Asia for Shivening scholars every year. I think yearly we send about uh, 40 to 50 scholars and uh, it's one of the highest per capita in the region and also around the world. So Malaysia is very well represented, represented in terms of uh, Shivening scholarships every year. And the next round of scholarships will be opening um, in September this year. So be sure to look out for that. And um, for any members of our audience who are interested in uh, applying, I would very much encourage you to do so. Um, we are basically an NGO, um, you know, registered with the ROS. We have about um, 190 to 200 registered members, although our pool of alumni are actually much larger. I think we've got thousands of alumni, um, unofficial, you know, alumni members. Um, and basically what we wanted CAM to be is, you know, essentially a platform for thought-provoking events on politics, the environment, and the economy, things like that. So, for example, we're having an interfaith dialogue now, you know, and a lot of it is supported by the Shivening Alumni Program Fund, which is a yearly fund that we apply, and it comes directly from the uh, secretariat in London via the, uh, the local British Embassy. And we apply for funding every year to organize this kind of event. So the Interfit Dialogue today is actually made possible because of CAPF. Um, and, you know, it really, uh, it really helps us, um, you know, dissect issues that are important to, in, you know, in Malaysian context and also regionally and things like that. So CAM has actually gained a strong global and regional reputation for capacity building. Um, CAM was one of the first, um, you know, alumni bodies in the region. And we kind of actually assisted the setting up of um, alumni bodies in other parts of the region as well. So some of the past events that we've done, um, you know, we've organized social forums, um, receptions for returning, uh, reception for returning scholars, um, and, you know, uh, events such as this. The last event that we held before this was the youth forum about a month back with Saeed Sadiq, Sadaru Sharif Hamdan, and also uh, Fidel Susmi, who is a Shivening alumni as well. Uh, this is just uh, our current office bearers. Um, so you'll see some faces that are with, with us today. Yeah. Uh, so we've got about 12 committee members in total and everyone is in charge, you know, of different areas. And we will be, uh, you know, uh, the election period is every, every two years we have an election. So the recent uh, office bearers were elected in September last year. These are some of our, um, you know, social media platforms and online platforms. So be sure to vi visit CAMP's social media pages uh, where you can follow us and also you're basically tuning into this live session from Facebook as well right now. Uh, if you have any ideas, comments, questions, maybe you'd like to see something different that you, you wish for us to organize, do email us and um, you know, we'd, be, we'd be happy to entertain those ideas. So now I'll move on directly into the interfaith dialogue for today. Um, for our members of the audience, I think you've seen this poster being circulated in the last couple of days. And we're very excited to have this uh, group of panelists. I think it's going to be an exciting discussion. Um, I'm just going to start off by introducing our first speaker. So, um, he is uh, no stranger, I think, to many of us. YB Dr. Sri Dr. Mujahid Yusuf Rawa. He is a three-term member of parliament for the Parit Buntar constituency in Perak and vice president of Fati Amanah Negara. Dr. Mujahid served as minister in the prime minister's department in charge of religious affairs under the Pakatan Harapan government from July 18 to February last year. He's an expert on interreligious interreligious relations, and he was actually previously elected chairman of the Southeast Asia Interfaith Dialogue for Peace, and is a published author of several books on Islam, 
nationhood and politics. Thank you very much, Dr. Mujahid, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Our second speaker is um, Reverend Dr. Herman Shastri. He is a religious practitioner, social justice advocate, and an interfaith peace builder. Reverend Dr. Herman currently serves as General Secretary of the Council of Churches Malaysia and sits on the Malaysian Consultative Council of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Sikhism, and Taoism. It's a mouthful, but they are doing really great work, so be sure to check them out. He was also deputy of the Special Committee on Interfaith Relations and Harmony under the Ministry of Unity for over 10 years. Reverend, Her Reverend Herman holds a PhD in Sacred Theology from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Our last but not least, our third speaker for this evening is Dr. Lai Sot Yen, who is coordinator of and senior lecturer in the Gender Studies Program at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya. She completed her PhD in, and Master's in Religion with specialization in Women's Studies at the Clement Graduate University, USA. She was awarded the Nippon Foundation Fellowship for Asian Public Intellectuals to conduct research on Buddhist religious women in Japan, Thailand, and also Indonesia in 2014. She has co-designed a course on gender and intercultural dialogue for a master's program and also co-teaches an undergraduate course on gender, religion, culture, and social change. Her research interests include the intersection of gender studies and religious studies, gender-based violence, and gender equality at the workplace. Thank you to all three speakers for being with us today. And now I'll very quickly introduce our moderator for this evening, Ms. Nisa M. Aris, who is a partnership and program strategist in a humanitarian organization with a background in psychology and counseling. Ms. Nisa is a 2018-19 Shivening alumna. She is active in several diversity, inclusion, and interface associations in Malaysia and Scotland. So I guess there's no one more apt to moderate this session today. She is also currently the honorary treasurer for Shivening Alumni in Malaysia. So I will not um, take any more time. Without any further ado, I will hand over the session to Ms. Nisa to moderate the panel discussion. Take it away, Nisa. Thank you so much, Akhil, for the introduction. Assalamualaikum and a very good evening to our noble judges, uh, guests, um, YB Dr. Shri, Dr. Mujahid, Reverend Dr. Herman, and Dr. Lai. So just like all of you, I'm very excited today to engage and learn from tonight's forum. Um, just like Akhil mentioned earlier, uh, especially because I was also an active volunteer in interfaith and diversity organizations um, in Scotland as well as, uh, as, well as Malaysia. So I had the privilege to experience other religions sharing sessions of their practices and spiritual journey in their holy places like the temples of Buddhists, um, Quaker, synagogue, churches, and others. Right. So we will divide tonight's discussion into three main narratives. Firstly, we're going to talk about what is the current climate of religious harmony in Malaysia and on hate speech in particular. Um, secondly, what is the role of religious organizations in promoting shared values and understanding? And how can we actually expand in other areas, especially during this challenging time? And lastly, our identity-based political parties, can we change and how can we do this? So before we start with the serious topic, I'd like to ask our dear panelists on one question. So, Given the choice of anyone in the world, whom would you want to have as a dinner guest? So it could be just anyone on top of your head right now. Okay, shall we start with Dr. Lai? Oh, wow. I get the $1 million <laughs> chair. Uh, I think I would like to have Mother Teresa just off the top of my head because also uh, when I was doing my, I, I focus on lots on religious women. And I've seen how awesome she is, the fact that she was able to bridge uh, religion and culture, right? And went to stay with the poor. So I, I think that's really wonderful. And that's really something to be learned from there, you know, to be able to live in simplicity. I've good friends in other religious tradition. Like I know uh, brothers, you know, in the Jesuit tradition, they actually have a wow of poverty. And I think it's not easy, right? To be with the community. It's easy to talk about poverty, but it's not easy to live with the poor. So I really, uh, I really admire her very much for her ability to do that and for her ability to be with the people and understand their culture and work with them. I think 
you know, really a big hand of applause from me. Wonderful, wonderful. How about Reverend? Oh, I think uh, Pope Francis would be an interesting uh, dinner guest, uh, taking the view that he is living in these modern times, uh, coming outside of the European context, uh, taking leadership of, a, of an established uh, religious bureaucracy that is centered around uh, the Vatican and then responding uh, pastorally to uh, the issues uh, across the board, young people, women, uh, critique of the uh, established church. And uh, <laughs> I don't think he would be having an easy time. And, uh, uh, but so far, he has uh, really shown an indication and a commitment uh, to be as truthful and as real and as, as, as uh, effective as a religious leader that is truly, truly committed to world peace and for justice uh, for the uh, oppressed sectors of society, wherever they may be. So that would be interesting dinner conversations with him. Can you bring me as well? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Dr. Mujahid, what about you? I was going to say Pope Francis too. Uh, <laughs> basically, because that makes it uh, makes us fall. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for for uh, for a, a Christian leader who is the the most populous uh, follower in the world, I believe that if I were to attend dinner with him, our conversation would evolve around peace between mm -hmm. Christians and Muslims, especially. But of course, if I were to have another choice, to have another guy on the same table with me, that would be Sheikh Al Azhar, uh, because Sheikh Al Azhar himself is uh, very uh, committed to peace, and he had uh, met Pope uh, Francis, or was it before that, before the Pope Francis, and they talk about uh, peace uh, among the people of the book. So I think that would be something that I would dream of one day to have a dinner with both of them and, 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 and to talk about peace. Can I, can I add on another person? Yes, please. Since uh, Dr. Mujahid have given two, I would actually add on uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Who's Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese. Ah. Yeah, he's actually very, very famous and engaged Buddhist who does lots of work on peace building as well. And I think he was even once nominated for a, a Nobel laureate. So I, I think it will be great. But of course, I also wanted to also sit with someone of a different religious tradition because then also I, I also wanted to learn from a, a tradition other than my own. But having two, you know, or three, someone from the Muslim tradition, I, you know, I really enjoy the company of Sister in Islam, they, uh, a religious group in Malaysia. The awesome work they do when they stand in solid, solidarity with people of other faiths. Uh, I, I really look up to them. So, uh, Dr. Noraini Othman, yeah, I yeah, she would be a wonderful dinner guest for me as well. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for the interesting answers. Well, we can only hope, and inshallah, of twenty twenty one, we can you know magic will happen. We don't know. Okay. Now let's get the ball rolling with our discussions. Um, for the first question, I would like to forward to Dr. Mujahid to dissect the problem of hate speech and racial or religious discrimination. In most cases, especially in countries like um, with pre-existing instability, like in India, um, Africa, and the US, the pandemic has amplified the already dangerous effects of polarization with serious ramification for public health. So this subjects countries around the world to a punishing test of solidarity at a time where many were already consumed with harsh political and societal division. We also did a small poll on our social media platform and um, some of them said, okay, we are more divided. On Facebook, 60% thinks we are more divided. But on my side, I did a personal poll, 36% um, thinks, hey, actually we are more united. So. Dr. Mujahid, personally, do you think the pandemic sparked increased divisiveness, especially in online spaces, and why? Mm. Well, uh, I 
I have said this earlier when the pandemic broke out in early 2020, that actually to look into the positive side of it, the pandemic actually unites uh, all of us, not just Malaysian, but also uh, uh, the world. That is simply because um, the issue of pandemic uh, uh, involves everyone as human. So in that light, it unites every human being in one particular uh, uh, agenda or one particular point that is to save life. And in order for you to save life, you need to save other people's life, your life and other people's life. So as you know, the pandemic is really colorblind. They do not pick and choose to uh, attack Malay or Chinese or Indian or, or Englishman or American. Uh, it is colorblind in that sense. And it affects the whole uh, global community, not just our country. And in that light, we felt we are more, or the, the more we need to get close together in terms of protecting ourselves. As one country is ravaged with this, uh, with this uh, flu or coronavirus, it will affect other nations too. So in that positive light, I think this is the best uh, moment of all the global community to unite to save life because every religion, uh, in spite of our political uh, differences, uh, sees life as the most vital thing that everyone should uh, protect, preserve, and conserve. And that, in, and that way, bridges the gap between all religious uh, sectors to work together to protect life. So yes, uh, what has transpired the divisiveness, it's not actually about the disease, it's not actually about the pandemic. What transpires the divisiveness is more of a political in nature. Unfortunately, when the pandemic uh, swept the world, we also had to face a political crisis, not just the global pandemic, but political crisis in all the nations, not just Malaysia, but in all other nations. So these two uh, political crises and the pandemic crisis uh, must be handled uh, together. And unfortunately, uh, the political crisis used pandemic for a political interest and dragged the whole nation to uh, debate on, uh, on the political crisis. But I, I'm not saying that that debate is, is, is wrong because this is democracy. You know, uh, there is this uh, issue that people of the global community were discussing about whether the pandemic will lessen democracy in the country. Uh, I believe yes, but in certain uh, condition where democracy is not really fully matured and not really being uh, uh, practiced fully, that could lead to a, uh, to a exploitation of pandemic for political reason to lessen democracy and rise the uh, autocracy. So that is, I think, uh, the issue that, uh, that narrates what you have just asked about uh, the pandemic. Uh, it is unavoidable for us also to talk about the political crisis within the society who discuss this in, in, in many perspectives. For example, if there were the lockdown, for example, uh, they would just uh, easily relate that to a political interest so that uh, the lockdown will lessen the political uh, tension, for example. That you can't avoid people thinking about it or perceive because of the uh, democratic environment that we have, uh, even in America for that matter, is not really stable. So uh, I believe uh, the nation need a lot of healing, not just the pandemic crisis, but also the nation overall in, in as far as the political crisis is concerned and consolidating democracy again as the platform to curb all this uh, 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 discussion and also that will definitely uh, uh, drag the nation into, into uh, chaos. I agree, Dr. Mujahid. Pandemic is indeed colorblind. Um, to expand further, a grave public health emergency may draw a country together and give leaders a chance to actually rise above and even heal chronic partisan divides, right? But yet on another, 
um, side heightened public anxiety. We feel like we are strained with governance um, capacities and there's differential impact of the virus on certain particular group, the immigrants um, and, and um, refugees um, or xenophobia. Um, this may exacerbate a long-standing challenges. So moving on to um, Dr. Lai, um, how can we fix the potholes that drive extreme mindsets like Malaysia or Malaysians only? Um, you know, of sort of inequality, social, economic alienation, poverty, and etc. I think we need to start from ourselves because so when we look at the us versus them mentality, right, it's very much based on how we categorize people based on the differences or similarity. Those who are similar to us, we say, you know, it's us, you know, they are part of us. But those who are different from us, it's them. And if anything goes wrong, and in this case, immigrants or migrant workers, they are at fault, right? And also because they are less powerless, they are unable to also intervene in the narrative in, in society, in the media. And very much so then, you know, it, it depends on the media to actually seek up their opinion. But how often does the media do that? I think if you look at the earlier news report, right, when the pandemic first broke out, or even uh, you see that there are certain articles or, you know, when it says, you know, migrant workers all needs to be tested. It's fine to say that, but it needs to get into, to go into more in depth as to why, right? It needs to highlight the fact that it's not because migrant workers is the cause of the disease, but it's because of the fact that they are not provided with the basic <coughs> rights in terms of the accommodation. You know, we know that, you know, they are, they are a bit like, not a bit, they are very much like sardine, all packed in a can, right? If, uh, the, the more you can fit, the better it is, you know, 10, 20, 10 in a room, say, for example. Which is why if you look at the cluster, some of the cluster with the highest numbers is actually involving migrant workers, you know, factory workers, because they are not being provided basic rights in terms of shelter, in terms of a decent shelter. It's not just a shelter, it's a decent shelter. So in that sense, I think it's very important for us to actually kind of create awareness surrounding that, uh, especially because they, uh, the seed, the mentality of us versus them has already been planted, which is why it's easy to resort to that, especially in times of pandemic or in times of hardship, because in times of hardship, if you need to blame someone, blame the, the, the powerless. It's similar in US as well, right? I think you see what has happened there as well, right? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think yeah, you're saying uh, what we need to do first. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, let me get back to that. Uh, we start at the personal level, meaning we, you know, we, we question. Um, I think it's very important for us to be reflective, even of ourselves, be critical of ourselves. You know that maybe part of us, you know, uh, not necessarily a big part, but at least even a small part of us sometimes could also have those kind of mentality because of the way how we have been conditioned, the society that we have been brought up in. Uh, because in all religious tradition, in men, you know, the place to start is actually with, with the self, right? Yeah. So I think it's very important for us to, to start with the self and reflect and see how we have contributed to the problem. And from there on, we could also find ways to address it. And I'm very glad that there are young people like the Shevening alumni in Malaysia that's looking into this. When you all do this, I feel that there's really hope for Malaysia because, you know, the future leaders, you, all of you are the future leaders. And so, of course, there's one at the personal level, but of course, at the wider level, we could also work with community in terms of raising awareness on the issue. In my class, I purposely choose uh, uh, have a session on inclusivity in media reporting and analyze how media could be sexist, racist, you know, uh, so on and so forth, using the COVID-19 as an example. So, you know, there are things like that we, we could do. Or we could also organize, if you look at uh, wanting to promote uh, understanding with other community, we could also organize trip, right, to immigrant community so that we understand better what their needs are. So we look at the situation, so we understand, we understand them, rather than just blaming them and Sometimes the blaming happen much more easily because we don't have any contact with them. We actually don't know them. And because of that, whatever the media says has more power because we don't know otherwise. So I think it'd be very important also to organize, uh, you know, um, 
I would say dialogue trip rather than exposure trip, right? Because I don't want them to be treated. I it, it won't be nice for them to be, you know, treated as you know, zoo, you know, like going to a zoo and and whatnot. So so it'd be great to have a, a trip where we can exchange uh, uh, information or where we could discuss, you know, uh, with each other so that we could understand them better as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lai. Um, I agree, we need to increase um, solidarity through self-reflection, um, being self-aware, and also working in community. Um, ultimately, we need to do our bits uh, to change perception towards especially marginalized groups, because if we don't help them and they are struggling, they will be, you know, the gap will be even further and people will be more polarized. polarized. Um, so the next discussion, um, topic would be on the role of religious organizations in promoting shared values and understanding. So as the coronavirus ravages uh, lives and economies, um, it's also pressing at the seams of our societies. So Malaysia had endured a number of unfortunate religious clash incidents. For example, mm -hmm. if you remember, Sipil Temple incident in 2018. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting because I work in humanitarian um, organization mm -hmm. where um, in PPR community, in 2018, the uh, Kwasa, everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, they can deal with one another. But until today, after the incident, they no longer talk to each other. They don't want mm -hmm. to even go to the meeting and, you know, to, to receive aid or to share their resources. So it's very unfortunate. So this one is for our Reverend. Um, can you share your insights on how do religious entities play their role in uniting the communities to be back together, especially in times of hardship? I think we are only faced with one challenge uh, as uh, religious practitioners. And that challenge is either we are a force for good or force for division. And this is a, a internal dialogue uh, that each of us uh, would have to engage in. Uh, what I'm, whatever I'm doing, am I helping to uh, safeguard human dignity, build up human community, uh, promote understanding, uh, build bridges, all these uh, metaphors that we can use. And then, of course, our religions are also uh, organized entities. And the same must apply. Uh, are we a force of good or are we a force of division? And again, there needs to be a reflection because something we may take for granted may come across quite different uh, to another community. And of course, in any context in the world uh, where you have majority minority relations, uh, this also factors into uh, the relationship uh, for social cohesion. And the third point that I want to make is I think it is important. The pandemic has uh, highlighted the fact that uh, religions must uh, play a very important role because they all speak of compassion. Uh, they, are, uh, they symbolize the highest ideals of, of uh, human flourishing uh, in the uh, spiritual uh, tenets that they have. Uh, but I would not restrict it to, to just uh, this pandemic period. I'm sure uh, in, the, in the concrete situation, uh, there are many good examples of uh, religious communities or religiously motivated individuals uh, who are coming out uh, to be a force of good to care, to uh, support, to uh, help, uh, to raise funds uh, for all those who are suffering uh, in this period. So uh, I, I would not deny that. But I think uh, uh, this experience, collective experience, must also be an enlightening one for us uh, because uh, we are living in a troubled world. And uh, when the COVID affects us, we make a big uh, fuss about it. But just think of communities that have been in suffering for a long, long time because of poverty, because of displacement, because of climate change, uh, because of the uh, deprivation of uh, human rights, 
uh, and so on and so forth. And this can be multiplied all over. And because of the global COVID situation, you see these things coming out from the cracks. You know, Black Lives Matter and all that. This is not a result issue. And it's coming from a context where the Christians are the majority. So there is, <laughs> they can use uh, all the words they want and say we are a force of good, but it's not coming across as that. You know, uh, there are uh, suppressed people or there are uh, hurting people and so on and so forth. So I think this COVID uh, should be a little window for us to enlarge our hearts, to embrace suffering people everywhere, regardless of religion and, and creed or, or race. Uh, and to be engaged locally and internationally to be a force for bringing greater justice and for the just distribution of resources for all people and uh, protecting the dignity of persons. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, this uh, COVID uh, can help us uh, move beyond ourselves. If we complain, just imagine those who are suffering, uh, even their voice are not being heard. So again, the question is, are we a force, religion is a, a force for good or for division? And if, the more we reflect on it and find the path that is for, for good, then uh, surely uh, we will only uh, find those positive energy uh, that can bring about a greater so, uh, cohesion and also learn in that way that uh, perhaps uh, bigoted views of our own beliefs uh, must be changed or not to impose some of our own uh, religious uh, tenets upon others or you know uh, or how do we build a human community that uh, that brings the, the common heritage of uh, humanity the fraternity solidarity of, of human persons uh, this these are all nice language and of course, there are many examples of, of such, but I think we are in a, in a world global crisis now and the uh, pandemic has uh, awakened the, all of humanity that uh, this is the time. We cannot go on doing business as usual uh, because it is going to have devastating effects on the environment, on human lives and human communities. I'm just wondering if I can, uh, sorry, Nisa, I, I just, can I interject a bit? Because I, I think you raised a very important uh, question. I, I really feel so, um, you know, so sad also to hear that how people in the community, right, have worked together, but now because of the incident, they haven't. I'm just wondering whether in this context, religious group can kind of be the middle person or, you know, someone who is seen as neutral could be the middle person to try and bring people together again. Of course, from time to time, that would be, you know, incident, you know, the, the devastating incident. It happens in our life as well. But how do we move on from that? How do we heal those scars as well, right? And I think I, uh, and I think also those issues are very hard to discuss. But perhaps also we can start, we can actually uh, get young people to come together, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. to, you know, to, to actually examine, to, to understand each other first, of course, you know, because to put them together and ask them directly to examine the issue, it might be just too much also, right? So maybe to, to have a camp where the young come together, you know, they, you know, they, uh, they try to build solidarity across the board to understand each other culture and whatnot. And as part of that, maybe towards the end also to use some example of those difficult you know, difficult situation in Malaysia for them to, to discuss and dissect and understand what really happened and what could be done, right, to bring the people together again. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I thought, you know, I, it really, you know, it really uh, touched me. So that's why I, yeah. yeah. Maybe one proposal for Dr. Mujahid, uh, maybe in parliament, he can propose that uh, we have a day of recognition for front liners. Yeah, and not just in this period of COVID, but any time in, uh, in our country where uh, individuals are rising up and coming together. Some are motivated by faith, uh, some maybe just by uh, 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 love for humanity, but they're all coming together and making great sacrifices and showing uh, how Malaysia is able to sustain that. You know? And I think... Uh, <laughs> This would be a good time. You may uh, get a good reception if you <laughs> made yeah, yeah. such a proposal. 
that's a good idea, Doctor Sherman. I think Herman. Uh, I think uh, we sh we all should work together. The religious sector, the community, the civil society, and uh, of course uh, the politician. Uh, the politician should go beyond their uh, party interests or personal interests to that of the greater interests of the nation, and uh, that would be a big task for a politician. And they are really tested actually, and being evaluated by the people on how they behave during such a situation. I always believe that a politician cannot and will not stand on their two feet alone. They must be uh, supported by the civil society. They must be supported by the religious sector across the religious uh, divide and also uh, other sectors like education. And I think that's where, as you have rightly mentioned, the COVID-19 has exposed everything, the lackness that we have, the vulnerability that we face, and also the weaknesses that all this while we thought was the strength that we had. So we need to reflect all this. And I think 2021 would be a very good platform, a very good opportunity to heal the nation to consolidate democracy and to talk about humanity more than to talk about race and just your religion. I think that's a great task for our 2021 mission. Yes, I do agree with that. Absolutely, I agree. So to extend further, um, Dr. Mujahid, um, what do you think the suitable programs or policies to promote greater cultural literacy and also inter-religious harmony, also to counter ultra-conservative and extremist narratives? Because again, it comes back to, okay, because what, what if I were to come back with that case, um, in the temple um, incident, um, they are not directly impacted by the incident, you see. It's because someone told them and it's all about perception. Mm. So, and then it, again, it polarized again, um, different communities, different religion, and it, it becomes me against you. So they yeah. become the ex on the extreme side. Yeah. So, yeah. If I can just respond to that question, to look into the bigger framework of our discussion uh, in terms of nationhood. If you look back into how our nation was founded, it was really founded under the conscious that this nation would be a multiracial, multireligious, a multi-faith nation. It's not something that comes afterward. I mean, our leaders have already uh, laid down a strong foundation that Malaysia would be a multiracial religion country, multi-ethnic country. And that is why you find in our constitution, the, uh, the foundation, which is so important, that is the uh, Islam as the official religion and other faith are free to practice. And also article 11 about freedom of religion, of course, with the caveat uh, article uh, 11, 4. But what, 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 whatever it is, I think uh, we must go back to our uh, founding nation, founder of this nation, that they, 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 they knew that this country would be that multiracial. It's something that is inherent in us. Something is not something that comes afterward. Okay, So that's one thing that, that needs to be reflected again. Number two is that uh, our relationship in this country is actually uh, a, 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 a dictated, or I mean to say not dictated, but uh, I mean, it, it, it's been clearly stated in our constitution. Because if everyone uh, understand our constitution, then there won't be any haters or there won't be any division in the country, especially when you look into the, uh, the equality in terms of all citizens must be treated uh, equally and shall not be discriminated based on their color, religion, faith, origin, background, ethnicity, and we added to that uh, and gender. So these are all, I've already been, uh, been, been, been laid out uh, strongly in our, in our constitution. That's one part of it. Second, the problem in us is that we have a politician in this country who depend on racial tension for their support. Uh, because they have not understood that this nation cannot be divided by race and religion. Although they're saying it in their speeches, but in terms of their action, they are not being inclusive in their policies. They are not being inclusive in their uh, 
uh, interaction with the public. They, they may say something to the Chinese community and something else to the Malay community. And that is not right, actually. You should have a very clear path on how politicians should behave, manage, and uh, uh, you know, promote their, their, their whatever political ideas that they have. Uh, you would have people who know that it is wrong for them to use race and religion for political purposes. But it's so tempting in Malaysia that uh, those who want to be popular must use uh, a race and, and, and religion. And to be unpopular is to, to do otherwise. Uh, so then again, you put the country into such a, a, a pressure and the politician into such pressure. But the worst uh, situation is that there are people in this country who believe that they are superior than others, who believe that their religion and their race is superior in terms uh, that justify them to look, uh, uh, to look down upon, upon other race or other religion, which is more dangerous than the politician who only exploit and uses religion, although consciously they know that it is wrong. And I think understanding that problem, uh, Nisa, will bring us to, 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 to answer your question. How are we going to uh, uh, address this issue? Number one, strengthen the understanding of our federal constitution and make that as a very important document of destiny, as uh, Dr. Professor Shah Farouk has mentioned in his book, which is actually uh, this constitution that we have is the best in terms of understanding the situation from its initial formation. It is only uh, we need to, to, to rejuvenate, uh, remind them again that this nation was not built based on race or religion. It was built based on multiracial materialism. Secondly, uh, I would uh, also suggest in terms of policy uh, that we should also uh, enforce that understanding, not just promoting it, but uh, you know, uh, have some uh, punitive aspect for those who breached the constitution of uh, bringing the people together. That was why when I was a member of parliament in the last term, I think, I, 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 as a member of National Unity Consultative Council, uh, which was formed under the prime minister's department, I was in opposition, the only opposition in that, in that seat, for your information, because I believe in, in unity, although I come from the opposition. We proposed what we call the uh, uh, race and racial harmony bill. Yes. Yeah, Akta Kaharmonia National, National Harmony Bill where we uh, have already proposed three things, three major things inside this act. That is one, a commission of race and racial harmony, where they can act proactively to any uh, a problem of race and religion and to uh, resolve them and advise or cons con uh, consult those who parties are concerned. That's, that's number one. And they are binding. Number two is uh, 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 the act of equality, ataupun hak uh, kebersamaan, kesamarataan, which uh, strengthens the Article 8 that I have just mentioned on no discrimination based on race, color, religion, and gender. And the third one is, is important, uh, based on our discussion to break the hate, is that we propose what we call the hate speech, uh, act of hate speech, ataupun akta kebencian kau, where there are some punitive aspect in it for those who breach and who promote uh, uh, such, uh, such behavior. Uh, and we had put a very high standard on how to define hate. So for example, if, there was, if, 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 if it is a repetitive remark, if it implicates others to hate and uh, implicate riots, for example, then that could be defined as, as hate. So that we already uh, 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 put the definition of hate at the highest standard, not just any uh, hate speech. You know? So these are so beautifully crafted by our members. Uh, and we proposed it in 2000, uh, I think uh, just 2014 or 2015, but then it was turned down and they, they wanted to actually repeal the seditious act 
to put in this this act. So I was I mean I was really honored to be part of that team because I was appointed as a chairman of law and policy. Uh, but then it was turned down. They wanted to uh, still maintain the Seditious Act with just a few amendments here and there. Because I think uh, uh, the Seditious Act is really archaic. I mean, it's, it's really something that was, uh, was uh, crafted by the British, you know. And of course, it had evolved. But this is a fresh for Malaysian to really define our relation, race relationship, and, and put a, a, a seriousness to, to, to those who promote hate. But unfortunately, when we came into power also for the past, uh, you know, 22 months in, in power, well, unfortunately, uh, we also uh, did not manage to put that as a new, new act, uh, maybe due to some other constraint and other priorities, but that's not a good excuse anyway. I do, uh, you know, I, I, I try to push hard so that this uh, act can be a table in the parliament, but unfortunately it didn't go to the, to the table. And nevertheless, if you were to ask me as a politician, of course, I don't believe law as the, the only way to solve the problem. I, I, I do not believe law as everything, but at least you have one aspect promoting our constitution as that basis for harmony and peace. Secondly, politician do not and cannot use uh, race and religion to promote their political ideologies and they must be progressive, inclusive uh, to all Malaysians. And thirdly is the punitive aspect that I have just uh, uh, deliberated. So as a politician, of course, I, 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 am, I, am, I, I, I myself as a religious scholar in terms of my background, but as a politician, if this is combined with the religious sector to help us to understand and promote peace and harmony, and we did just that, during the New Zealand incident, if you remember, Dr. Uh, was there, Reverend was there, we did this uh, solidarity, uh, peace solidarity. Uh, things like that could move people to, towards such, uh, such narrative that we want. And I tell you, that is a huge task. And that is why when I was the minister in the Prime Minister's Department uh, charging in, in Islamic Affair, I proposed what I call the uh, compassionate Islam or Islam Rahmatan Lil Alamin. Compassionate Islam was actually to address all these issues that we're speaking. But 22 months was not uh, really right for me to actually put that into uh, practice. And also I integrated within that framework of uh, compassionate Islam uh, into that of the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDG, which I think is so much close to the compassionate policy and everyone should support such ideas uh, in, in, in hoping and inspiring Malaysia to become that compassionate nation that we all dream of one day. Thank you, um, Dr. Mujahid. I also believe in um, strengthening our understanding on the constitution. Um, we can also do something like, you know, preventive effort programs, like a round table with religious leaders together with community and political leaders, because sometimes um, there's gap. When community leaders meet up with political leaders, there's no religious leaders there. So there's no gel that just blends things together and make it, you know, push things forward without any agenda. So yes. um, that is a beautiful connection to our final topic, which is on so social and political sphere. Um, so again, uh, Dr. Mujahid, fostering bottom-up uh, leadership among political leaders, um, parties, increasing space for moderates and progressives to be elected into the office. Do you think Malaysia is ready for this? Well, uh, uh, I think that is a huge task because as a politician, practically speaking and realistically speaking, at the end of the day, it is your voters. Coming from the constituent, the rural constitution like me in Paribota, it's really hard for them to grasp all these ideas that we are talking about. They only know of their, their, their simple life. Uh, and, and, and of course, there are other, your opponent are fanning the issue of race and religion and slandering you with so much, uh, you know, false uh, on you, uh, attacking your personal, I think, uh, yeah, uh, what they call this personal attack on you. And this actually affects us as politicians because you have two things here. One, at the end of the day, 
how good you are talking about your idealism, you need to address to your constituent because it is them who's going to vote uh, for your for your victory. Number two, uh, it's a huge task, as I said earlier. Uh, there are no such conducive arrangement for such thinking to be the uh, the mainstream, you know, in, in the society. So you really had to face ideological confrontation into making them understand what moderation is, understanding what inclusivity is. Uh, even you mentioned something about programs going, a Muslim goes to the church, for example, to get to know what other, uh, how other faith uh, are practiced, even going to the uh, temple, for example, would be a very serious and sensitive issue. So this has to be addressed. It could be easy for, for the NGO to talk about it, but for a politician, uh, believing in that and trying to promote that could also be something that will uh, defeat your 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 presence in the in your constituent. But having said that, uh, uh, it's not an excuse. That's why I said it, it's a huge task for me. I believe that the way forward is to uh, maintain the stream, uh, the, the 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 mainstream of politics maintain the mainstream of political parties, maintain the mainstream of party leaders that is on such thinking and on, on such mode. And uh, balancing that with the reality that you face at the grassroots and trying your wisdom uh, to, to, to handle between the two, that will be the way forward and a very challenging task for even young leaders like you guys. I mean, even young leaders like you guys also has to understand where you operate uh, in terms of the, as you were mentioning, are the public ready? Are the, you know, and we are very, uh, we are very, I would say divisive in terms of, you have the rural sector, you have the semi-rural sector, you have the urban, you have in Kuala Lumpur, it's not the same as Parik Bunta, it's, it's, it's rural. You know, and at the same time, of course, you have to address poverty as uh, uh, Reverend uh, Herman has mentioned it rightly. Poverty is the issue. Uh, gender issue, uh, Dr. Uh, Lai, is also an issue even in the rural areas. Mental health issues. Uh, so that has to be put everything into a balance between that idealism that you have and the practicality mm -hmm. uh, that is in the, on the ground and choose uh, uh, issues that will not forego whatever principles that you believe in for the future. But I'm very optimistic. We have a way forward. And I, I, I see Malaysia to be a country free from prejudice, free from racism, free from hate. But it will take years for us to make sure that happen. Thank you, Dr. Mujahid. I guess for all of us, we have Dr. Mujahid here that will support our progressive initiatives, inshallah, because we can take the risk as NGOs and um, young leaders, and we will have you an expert and the rest um, to support, inshallah. Um, to extend further, um, Dr. Lai, um, do you think there's a future for Malaysia beyond religious or racially based political parties or even institutions? Whether that's the future, I think we need to start somewhere. If we, if we don't start anywhere, there will definitely not be a future. So of course, you know, as uh, Dr. Mujahid has mentioned, it will be tough, it will not be easy. But having said that, you know, we need to start. If you look at the civil rights movement in many countries, and even, you know, I'm sure you have heard of the saying, Rome is not built in a day, right? It takes effort. And if you look at the South African context, it, it, it just does not take efforts. It actually takes leader to suffer, to sacrifice themselves for it. Nelson Mandela was in jail for how many years, right? Yeah. So it's the same for Malaysia. I think, uh, and I believe we have leaders who will be willing to sacrifice and who be who would be willing to actually start the movement. And I think right now uh, we have seen that happening. I'm sure if you have followed the news, right? There's actually initiative to form uh, to run candidate based on issues rather than along political parties. I think if you look at the, uh, I think uh, it's Gerak Independent, if I'm not mistaken, right? And Maju is part of it, besides Kita, Kita Jaga Kita and, and, and another NGO. 
So, so I think there's actually initiative already. And in fact, if we were to look back in history, that's not the first time that's being done. In terms of, uh, of, of getting candidates to run based on issue, in the, 19, in the 1999 or the 10th general election, there's, there was also such an initiative. I personally supported the uh, Women's Candidacy Initiative, where they actually asked a, a Tony Kasim, you know, the late Tony Kasim, and she ran on the platform of women's issues. And also at the time, there were also lots of uh, people from civil society, you know, uh, Sivarasa Rasia, Tian Chua, they're actually from the civil society. They were, say, they were seeing that, you know, when you work from the civil society, you know, there's no political power, it's hard to make changes, which is why they decided to enter into politics. But of course, as uh, realizing the, uh, the practical part of it, if you want to run in, uh, in uh, if you want to run as a candidate, right, it's not just a matter of, uh, right now, if you look at Gurak, they've actually discussed about Gurak Independent, they've discussed about having good candidates. So that's one of it. I think good candidates, very easy. Malaysian have lots of talent. And I could see maybe Nisa, you know, Zai Mozani, or Akil Yunus, right, in future be one of the candidates as well, right? I think we have that candidate, no problem. Fundraising, if you talk about, you know, the, the urban base, I think also, you know, the connection that you have, probably no problem. Media savvy, social media savvy, also no problem. The problem where I see it is actually the, uh, the machinery, because also back then we also realized, especially when you talk about, the, you know, and uh, Dr. Mujahid delineated very well just now, it's not just about the urban constituency, you also have to look at the rural constituency, you also have to reach the semi-urban constituency because there are different dynamics at play and you need to reach them. And uh, compared, to, compared to the urban nights, like we have this session in English, right? But to be able to reach them to talk about those issues, we actually need to also have a conversation in, in Malay as well, right? Because when we talk about the rural hinterland, you know, uh, even if you talk about my, the student in my class, right? If they are from the B40, you know, and you, you can tell very quick whether they're urban or rural, because when they're urban, the English uh, command of English tends to be better. But if they are rural, you know, the command of English tends not to be so, you know, not to be so good. So it's also about having the machinery to do that. And it's also about having also awareness, you know, in, in languages other than English, because urban people, I think, are probably more aware of those issues compared to the rural or semi-urban uh, areas. So I think those are the challenges. And of course, also to be able to, to kind of uh, be there for the long haul, so to speak, right? If you just run in the election, I, I bet you, you know, I, I can bet my, uh, you know, 100 ringgit yeah, or how many, yeah. uh, just, uh, just speaking figuratively, yeah. I'm not trying to, uh, to promote gambling or whatnot, yeah. please don't misunderstand, yeah. <laughs> just a figure of speech, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll bet my last dollar yeah. in the next election, probably, you know, you know, it won't do it, you know, you, you won't be able to win. But if you're there in the long haul, if you start working with, with the community, if you're trying to figure out ways to work it, yes, you know, the next generation maybe, right? But of course, if it happens sooner, I'll be the happier for it, right? But, uh, but, but I guess those are the issues that we need to look into. I wouldn't say it's not possible, it's possible, because otherwise we don't have United Nations, right, that enshrine all those universal values. Otherwise, you know, we don't have civil uh, movement. Otherwise, we don't have the federal constitution, you know, there's lots of beauty in it as well, right? But it all takes effort. So hopefully we'll get there someday. And I have high hopes on people like you all, Nisa, Ares, yeah, Akil, Yunus, yeah. So yeah, let's work towards that. Thank you, Dr. Lai. We also agree on issues related uh, political parties and hopefully more and more people are coming on board and focus on what's important rather than what's uh, fulfilling their own agenda. So um, another topic, just to add, um, according to National Suicide Registry, 53% of suicide deaths in the past eight months were from those aged between 20 to 40. So also, if I may add, um, Reverend, um, you posted on Twitter uh, last November that the churches are willing to help anyone in desperate needs. So Reverend, um, how do you think religious body in Malaysia can play its role in the mental health of the society and also in providing coping mechanism uh, in times of hardship, especially now? Uh, let me respond by saying that it's not a, a specialty of, of one religion. I think all religion 
have that compassionate heart and uh, however they are organized, uh, there is a strong sense of bond among those who belong to the community of faith. And they have uh, within them also mechanisms uh, to care for those who are hurting and those who are suffering. So I think in a situation uh, like this, uh, it calls not just for our thinking of our own community, but also thinking of uh, those who are really affected. And uh, I think uh, one of the difficulties that uh, uh, we don't see much of that in, in uh, national media, but a lot of it is going through in social media. Uh, so, for example, just uh, take a very relevant case now with the floods. And so a lot of pictures are shown and, and some of these are from the rural areas. And uh, it's not just the pandemic, but now they have to contend with the flood. And so there's a lot of conversation within uh, the circles of social media, how we can help, uh, what we can do. You know, uh, is there a contact? there that we can send some funds and, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, the, the narrative of uh, people's mobilization for compassion uh, is always there. Uh, it is not a special trait of Malaysia. I think in every country uh, there is uh, only when that uh, disaster is such a enormous one, like an earthquake and all that, that they, of course, uh, have more uh, media attention to it, but it's happening all the time. Even in our residence association, uh, there are exchanges uh, on the WhatsApp. Uh, this uh, elderly couple uh, cannot go out to, so can somebody assist to buy the provisions and all that. So all these things are going on. And I, 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 I think that is the, 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 the sh sure sign that we are not the, the controller of, of such narrative. I think human beings uh, from their own personal uh, motivation and uh, whether it be faith-based or whether humanitarian based, uh, they are doing it uh, yeah. there. But, they are, but people are looking at, at, at organized religion and they are uh, rightfully uh, raising a, a critique and saying, you know, you, you got so much money from the government or you go so, uh, yeah. uh, so much uh, privilege in this and all that, but you're not doing enough uh, for... Uh, the poor or those who are affected in uh, various communities throughout the country. And I think uh, this is where uh, then we have to accept that critique uh, and uh, perhaps uh, also think of uh, noble ways to uh, engage in interfaith uh, initiatives. And so in my own case here in the Patalin Jaya uh, area, we are just opposite the university hospital. And so we provide whatever uh, assistance we can uh, for the frontliners so uh, they can come and rest in our building park in our building and, and do whatever and we, we we do what we can it doesn't matter uh, whichever uh, religious affiliation or we don't put up barriers that you cannot come to a, a, a building where uh, it's owned by the council of churches secondly when the mp in our case the mp is uh, maria chin uh, she uh, knows of all the families that are affected. And so the, every now and then she sends out an alert and says we have 50 families that need provisions. And then we just pull in, you know, uh, and just uh, try to raise the funds, get it from individuals, get it from churches, uh, get it from any other organizations. And when it is given out there, we are not putting a, a stamp there and say, this is pristine. Christian provided provision, or this is a Hindu or Buddhist or whatever, it's for, for all, you know. And uh, I think uh, the COVID uh, experience has shown us that uh, the more we do this, uh, the more respect we will gain as, as religious practitioners. Uh, because if not, people are just uh, saying, you know, yeah, of course, you're always talking of the noblest thing, but the, lead, the last one to be uh, at the front line or do something. So I think. Uh, it's also a credibility uh, issue uh, at this time that we as religious communities uh, respond the best we can and if we cannot do it alone or perhaps even uh, encourage not to do it alone uh, so that it comes out uh, across as a as a 
Malaysian Act as a building of community. I think that's uh, the moderator seems to have. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I think it's very beautiful that Malaysian has. Oh, okay, you're changing uh, to a more. Okay, pass it back to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm still Lisa. I'm, I'm not Akil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, thank you so much, Reverend. Um, uh, if I may just technical. add on the constitutional, um, may I just, just one line on that? Glitch, okay. Yeah, I think um, the young we people. We are going to move. Okay. Um, I hope you guys can hear my voice. Yes. Is it clear? No. Yeah. Good, all right. Perfect. Right. Um, so we are moving on into the question and answer session. Um, the first question comes from, um, we have over 100 participants on live uh, Facebook. It's fantastic. Um, right. Okay. The first question would be, question would be, okay, this comes from um, our um, RSVP. The first would be, um, it has been said that um, uh, in Malaysia, there's assumption that it's the politician who have poisoned the universal faith of humanity. What are the imperatives for interfaith harmony in Malaysia? So anyone the question, want to, uh, to the politician here? I'm the only politician here. <laughs> we, we, I know my, you answer first and then I will interview the one politician viewpoint. That's also fine. <laughs> Yes, Nisa, do you want me to address, uh, answer that question? I think maybe they can't hear you. I think there are probably audio issues. Oh. I think, why don't you just go ahead, uh, Dr. Mujahid? Yeah, it has been said that a uh, politician creates more trouble than anyone else. Um, but uh, I presume politicians should play their noble role. Uh, in promoting peace, in promoting solidarity, and in also promoting uh, humanity. Uh, not all politicians uh, like to poison the society with all these issues because they know in their deep conscience that at the end of the day, it will uh, affect the whole nation because playing religion and race is like playing fire. You are igniting fire, and uh, you know creating destruction. So, although it seems like uh, most politician, as I said earlier, if you remember, used or exploit race and religion for their own personal agenda, for their own personal interest, because uh, our society is so fragile in terms of these uh, issues of race and and religion. And it also has a lot of following too. But if you ask me uh, personally, number one, since day one, I started my career as a politician, I always believe in uh, the role of politician is to promote peace and unity and solidarity. Number two, I always believe that politician should look people in the eyes of, uh, of, of humanity, not in the eyes of their race or their religion. Because uh, at the end of the day, support uh, come from every, uh, every part and every uh, race in this country. And thirdly, I think uh, those who poison uh, people with politician, with religions, with, with, with issues of religion, it cannot last long because as the, 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 the mainstream of ideas about promoting a, a harmonious society and unity among the people, uh, this politician will be obsolete. You know, they will be just, uh, you know, making their way out. Uh, to all politicians, I think using race and religion is the worst thing a politician can do because they will destroy the nation, they will create hate, and they do not promote any sense of unity or humanity for that matter. So maybe in the future uh, to curb such uh, 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 intention, there should be a clear stand on all political parties should not be based on race and 
and religion. It should be based on being uh, a, a political party that promotes their policy, political party that promotes their ideas about nationhood, uh, their ideas about solidarity, their ideas about economy, their ideas about uh, how to prevent extremism, how to prevent hate. So I think uh, if there is a clear picture uh, constitutionally and also legally that uh, in future, we cannot accept any political party that is based on race and religion in terms of creating hatred among the people and promoting hatred. I think that could be a way forward. But again, the question is, uh, are the people ready for such uh, understanding? I give you an example. Uh, you remember what happened in the uh, ICERT, International Convention on Elimination of Race and Religion, when we were uh, in power, they had used this ICERT issue not uh, to, I mean, they had used it for, for, a, for a political reason that create div division in the country, that promote hate among, among uh, a race in this country, uh, which is a classic example on how the country is not ready. And uh, we were very concerned on, on that issue in terms of prioritizing the need for us uh, to you know, put what are the priorities that uh, we need to, to uh, uh, put forward. So there is a classic example of ICERT issues, a classic example of ADI issue that was mm. tracked, the nation was tracked yes. into a, a race, hate-based politics, race, uh, politics, religious uh, sentiment, and other issues that if you look into the 22 months of our our uh, the Pakatan Harapan government, which aspire for a new Malaysia, Malaysia Baru and all that, but still it really uh, uh, you know, taught us a lesson that the country is not ready, the people is not ready, and we really have to be careful in terms of managing that change and changing the ideas, which has been deep rooted since uh, 60 or 70 years ago. Yes. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not among those who poison people with race and religion. <laughs> Dr. Lai, do you have um, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think yes, to, to a certain extent, some of those politicians are responsible. But I think we citizens have a role to play. It's, it's because, you know, why do, we let, why do we let them get away with it? Why don't we hold them responsible for it? And I think it's our civic duty to actually speak up when that happens. And it's also very important when we talk about faith-based organizations or, you know, in terms of what we could do, and I think it's very important for us to stand up for other religious tradition, especially when something happens, right? Because when you look at stories, I've actually saw a movie uh, in terms of the persecution of Muslims in, uh, in Burma or in Myanmar. And the story was very touching because also the Muslim also shared about, yes, those who persecuted her is actually, you know, we also have monks, Buddhist monks who are also extreme just as they are peace-loving Buddhists like Thich Nhat Hanh and, you know, me and, and, and many others Buddhists as well. But she was also sharing how in, the, in, those, in her moments of need, other Buddhists also come to help her, right? They protected her. So I think in that sense, I think it's also very important for us to, you know, to be able to stand up for others as well, you know, <coughs> for people of other religious tradition, especially when we see that they're being threatened. I, I think when we talk about interfaith harmony, interfaith understanding, that's really what it is at the heart of it, right? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lai. Like this connects to a question from Facebook from Alice Tan. Um, she said, she asked, um, how do we convince Malaysians that it is only for the better of us to befriend one another rather than women in our own cocoon? Uh, I would say just make friends with your neighbors. I stay in the condo and I find that actually the con especially I also have to thank COVID-19, though I, I dislike COVID-19 for many reasons, you know, online teaching and whatnot. And sometimes the connection is bad, you know, and sometimes students have problems and I have extra work to design curriculum. But there's one thing I, I'm thankful for. I'm more at home. And because of that, I get to know my neighbors. I know my neighbors who are Muslim, <laughs> who are Indian and whatnot. I actually make it a point to, you know, to, you know, like uh, sometimes during Chinese New Year, right? To actually give them, uh, you know, uh, to, to give them small souvenir, right? So that we have a chance to actually bond and to know each other. And the other day when I was talking to my former, uh, the, the, the former coordinator of gender studies, Dr. Rokia Talib, 
I'm very thankful to her because she actually see beyond race and she hired me to work, right? She didn't look at race. Oh, okay, she's not of the right race, so therefore I don't hire her. I'm very thankful she didn't do that. So she went beyond race and she said, hey, she has the expertise, so therefore I hire her. She was also sharing stories of how she actually helped her Chinese neighbours. Her Chinese neighbours who are elderly to do the shopping and whatnot because it's very hard for them to get around. I think when we talk about a religious or, or understanding or bridging the divide between different races, I think we also have to start from there. You know, make it a point to make friends of different religious tradition. Yeah, and we can start from our neighborhood. So I'm very thankful because of the COVID-19 also, I get to know my uh, uh, neighbors who are of different faith as well. Thank you, um, Dr. Rai. So another one that we get from our RSVP list, uh, this one for uh, Reverend, um, what is the role of faith-based entities in countering hate and extreme, extremist narrative peddled by irres irresponsible parties? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, about three years ago, I was at a UN conference uh, deal dealing precisely with this issue. And uh, we had a very interesting week because we were comparing uh, many of the different conflict prone areas and then how uh, religions were either adding to the conflict or were providing a very prophetic role to, uh, towards peace building. And from that, I learned that the two things must happen. One is, uh, I think there needs to be uh, uh, an educational process for religious leaders. Uh, uh, and I think uh, one of the difficulties that religious leaders think, uh, I'm, I'm schooled in my own religion, and therefore I don't need to uh, uh, learn anything else. Uh, uh, but when we are living together, uh, and fostering social cohesion, uh, there are even some things within uh, the theological vocabulary of our own uh, tradition that may cause hurt. Uh, and it's, it's always a, a very interesting experience to have interfaith leaders sitting together and, and the UN conference, we were doing that. And we looked at the Myanmar and there were Buddhist monks uh, from both sides of the divide, and you could see how the reaction, but uh, it's a UN conference, so uh, they, they could uh, moderate it well, and so also in others. And now, of course, now you're looking at uh, uh, the recent happenings in the US, and you see what role religion is, is being played and how it's being ideologically uh, driven. So I think the, the first discipline is that there must be a uh, uh, critical reflection uh, of our own faith traditions and what we take for granted uh, may not come across uh, and may not support uh, the steps for peaceful coexistence and cohesion. Then the second thing, of course, is as uh, Dr. Mujahid has said, and I completely support that, uh, is the uh, uh, formation in constitutional uh, peaceful coexistence. And uh, we use this big word, uh, but I think we must make that uh, uh, document a part of our everyday life experience. And uh, that can only come about when there's more uh, 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 narrative given to how uh, people are living out uh, the, the, the strengths of our constitution. And of course, so Malaysia, one case we would say is that we celebrate each other's uh, festival. You know, I mean, and, and that's uh, a beautiful thing, but it's also uh, something that gives meat to our peaceful coexistence as, as envisaged by our found, founding fathers. And I just want to end this segment now with this, that I think what is lacking is uh, formation, uh, uh, either to education or to engagement of the young in the constitution. I think they only hear it uh, when it becomes an uh, issue. Uh, in my school days, we had a very healthy uh, debating societies and interact club and all that. So I don't know whether that uh, exists anymore. But uh, there, there should be this kind of thing of, of parliament of, of young people, you know, uh, and not just a national one, but maybe in each state there should be one where young people are being trained and then can draw upon the constitution and speak articulately and, and, and begin 
to own this uh, document of our common destiny. I think if, if that does not happen, uh, it, then it becomes like a class lecture. And, and, you know, and we are just telling uh, people what is good about our constitution or whatever, but it's not, uh, they're not connecting it to real life or uh, raising the critical questions that should be raised because uh, democracy is always a uh, uh, work in progress. Uh, we don't have an ideal uh, society anywhere in the world, but uh, there are strengths and, and weaknesses that need to be engaged in. Thank you, Reverend. We all agree that education is a lifelong journey, even for religious leaders. Um, and all of us, we need to learn to unlearn and relearn new things because we evolve and the world change every single day. So we need to adapt to the current situation. Right. Um, last but not least, another important question to our panelists. Um, can each of you share if you can have one superpower? What do you choose to have and why? One superpower, anything is possible. Superpower? Yes, superpower. Something like a magic wand or something? Yes, anything, anything. <laughs> well, my, 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 I think my dream to have a superpower is to unite all humans together. That would be my mm -hmm. most superpower because that is the most difficult thing people can do. You know, when you talk about power, it's something that is difficult for men to do. And if you can achieve <laughs> such, such thing, then you have that power. And I think this power does not lie on one person because this power lies on every human being, every soul that believes every human has a right to live, every human has a right to be respected, regardless of their race, religion, and background. And I think if we can uh, uh, have that uh, strength uh, to make that power to be that dominating uh, power, then we will be the superpower and uh, peace would be the order of the day rather than war, hate, and uh, and going back to our country, uh, to be specific, uh, the, the 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 strength, the magic wand that we need post COVID is to heal the nation uh, and uh, to consolidate democracy, which I think is the if everyone can uh, come together on board in this uh, strength. I believe uh, Malaysia can be better in the future and every uh, country or every every people in this country uh, we should be see we should look into them uh, as one nation people of Malaysia everyone loves this nation everyone loves this country and we we must be colorblind more colorblind than ever if covid-19 was colorblind the pandemic is colorblind then in order for us to protect the country, we must also be colorblind. That will be the most utmost superpower that I wish I could have. Wonderful. Power to unite and power to heal. Uh, Reverend, what about you? Uh, I think the, <laughs> that word would be a service, a selfless service. And I think uh, the more we uh, are uh, spiritually engaged, uh, the more we must learn to take each step uh, a day, either from what we are doing or from what religion we represent or which community we come from, that all of this, the religion stands or falls in uh, whether it is touching lives and transforming society. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Mujahid had spoken about uh, uniting and that's a very central uh, feature. But I think also uh, selfless giving means that uh, you do not uh, become a consumeristic person. You do not take more than what you want. You, you are uh, able to uh, live uh, in such a way that, uh, or simply live that others may simply live also, you know, and, and share resources and, and have such uh, spiritual uh, values that uh, put the human person, the well-being of others uh, uh, more important than uh, having all the money in the world or all the power in the world and so on and so forth. 
And I think when we when we just always keep, and I, I think even all the great teachers have spoken about it. Gandhi said, if you need a talisman, then this is the talisman that you need, that every day, whatever you think, whatever you do, must be for the good of the other. If not, uh, that uh, thought is useless and that action is useless. And I think most of, uh, in my Christian uh, faith, uh, Jesus himself says, you know, you, if you want to follow me, uh, give up everything and follow me. Uh, you know, where your treasure is, there is your heart. You know? So if your treasure is in the well-being of others, then that would be the, the most uh, fulfilling uh, spiritual experience that you would have. That is very beautiful, the power of selflessness. And it's not easy to reach that. That's why it has to be a superpower, right? Um, Dr. Lai, what about you? For me, it's actually the power of love and the power to listen to others. Because I think when, I, when we have the power of love and power to listen to others, we can actually shift our position and we could also be bridges of love and to heal instead of, uh, instead of all the hate speech, instead of the, all of the blaming that we have spoken about. So I really wish for that. And for me, what is important is actually not to memorize what is in our religion, but it's actually to be able to leave out the principles of the religion right in our lives. And for me, it would be what Buddha has actually taught, you know, a life full of compassion, a life full of love, and also justice. That is, that that be. I feel so humble because if I were to ask the same question, what superpower I want to have, it would be like teleport. But talking to beautiful, beautiful, wonderful panelists, you open, um, widen the horizon into much impactful superpower that we can actually um, dream to have. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think that kind of summarized our discussion. Uh, thank you to all panelists for the insightful, share, insightful sharing and also answering a uh, question from our audience. Um, so with that, I would like to pass the torch to Akhil. Thank you for having me and I hope everyone will have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much too for having us, yeah, for having me. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers um, for being with us uh, this evening. I think for the past hour and a half, we've seen so much um, idealism and hope kind of, you know, seep through this session. And I think uh, if only this was, you know, this, this kind of sense of idealism was replicated, you know, through millions of the Malaysian population or the worldwide population, I think we'd be in a really good position. Unfortunately, that idealism isn't, you know, reality. And But this is a great start. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, on behalf of CAM, uh, I'd also like to thank our committee members who've been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make this happen, to make this a success. Um, I think it was a really exciting and enlightening session. So we are going to be ending the um, Facebook Live session now. Thank you to the speakers.